everybody. Today, we're going to be presenting on geospatial data. The name of this presentation is Getting Your Mind Around Open Search Geospatial Data. Now, before we get into it, let's just go over um, our particular agenda for today. Uh, we'll be talking about the project itself. I have a personal story for you today. Um, we'll talk about how geospatial indexing works, give you some examples, and talk about how you can get involved and contribute to the project. So uh, without further ado, let's introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kyle Davis. Uh, this is what I look like. I know you see me on the playback here, uh, but I will say that, um, you know, I recently got word that my barber went out of business. And uh, I haven't given myself home haircuts for the extent of the pandemic. And um, I hope to get into a time where uh, I once again can look like that with perfectly groomed hair. Uh, when we meet in person, for sure, uh, I will look like that. So I don't want you to look at what you're seeing in the playback and think this is the way I look in a normal situation. We don't live in normal times. Now, what do I do for a living? Uh, I am the senior developer advocate uh, for open search at AWS. Um, now, I was originally hired for a slightly different uh, product called Open Distro for Elasticsearch, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but uh, I work exclusively with open search these days and open search is open source. So I work exclusively with open source. So I don't really do much with AWS as far as the um, services which um, are offered to cloud customers. Uh, a little bit about me uh, and I like to do this in numbers. So let's just take these numbers uh, away. This way I don't have to read directly off of a slide uh, 92. 1992 to be example, that was the year that I first started getting serious about writing software. Uh, one of my first projects was um, actually uh, writing a compiler. Um, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world when I was growing up. I know, I know, and it, it doesn't seem like something where, uh, you know, somebody who is, uh, should be outside riding his bike would really think much about writing a compiler, but I thought it was so interesting. And I checked out all the books from the library uh, and spent my days uh, for a good part of a year writing a compiler. And I released that thing uh, as shareware. Uh, I have lost it. Uh, I have looked on all the diskettes at home, my dad's house, I can't find it. Um, and, and I hope that it's floating around somewhere because I want to be completely horrified of what I wrote when I was quite young um, and released it to the world. Uh, no one, I think maybe a dozen people used it, um, but uh, it was, uh, something that was out there. It was kind of my first foray into it and one of my first serious projects. But ever since then, I, the bug has bit me and I've been into software and writing software and, and you know, working with uh, computers. Um, 241, maybe 242. That's the number of days I've been working at Amazon. So I'm a relatively newcomer to the organization. Now, um, I say that because maybe you're watching this on the second day of this conference, I'm not sure. Three, the number of search engines I've worked with. Uh, search is a domain that I find fascinating. Um, and I was maintaining uh, some software that I used for another project that was a search engine built on top of Redis. And then later on, I worked on a, a search engine built in Redis. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff floating out there um, that I wrote about that. But I, the, again, the bug bit me. Um, I think it's such an interesting, um, way of dealing with data that's kind of something that when I started learning about kind of how it worked, I was fascinated. Um, so I do think it's a demand that I, that I like to spend my time with. 53. 53 is the parallel of which I live. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which will play a weirdly important role in this very presentation. Eight. Eight is the number of pounds that my dog weighs. You may here in the background, my dog barking, and I apologize. That is the world in which we live. Um, so, you know, do keep that in mind if that's something that you do see. Um, he is an Italian Greyhound. He is uh, 12 years old. Uh, so if you do follow me on social media, which I encourage you to do, uh, it's about equal parts 3D printing, search engines, and my dog. Um, so uh, you now know a little bit about him. So. Let's first go into the open search project. Now, this is a project which I think is important to know the context in which it came about. 
I want to read the definition uh, here. The definition of the project is something we've kind of circulated around. It's a new project. In fact, this is like one of the first conferences we've ever talked to about it at. Um, so something that I don't expect people to understand. So we're really being explicit about um, kind of telling people. So open search is a community driven open source search and analytics suite derived from the Apache 2.0 licensed Elasticsearch 7.10.2 and Kibana 7.10.2. It consists of a search engine daemon, OpenSearch, and a visualization and user interface, OpenSearch dashboards, as well as a series of functionality adding tools and plugins. Now, I mentioned earlier that I started work at Amazon uh, on the project called Open Distro for Elasticsearch. That project's been around for a while, started in 2019, and that project was basically those series of tools and plugins that worked with open source Elasticsearch and Kibana. Well, earlier this year, Elasticsearch and Kibana had a license change. And the last version of um, the open source Apache 2 version of Elasticsearch and Kibana was 7.10.2. And open source, uh, excuse me, um, Elasticsearch was really important. Kibana was really important to a lot of folks. And so um, it was important to Amazon as well. Um, and so, um, the opportunity was there to take that code and fork it into a new project. And that's where open search and open search dashboards come in. So in that process, uh, basically it created a clean code base. And clean code base was basically taking Elasticsearch and Kibana and the code base had some other non open source licenses mixed into it. Um, and we removed those out, um, leaving just the Apache 2.0 stuff. Additionally, there was the name change, which was important as well, and um, removing any other types of things that tied it to the previous project. So there were build tools and um, you know uh, pieces of um, telemetry that were collected and um, metrics that were being out there. Um, it, all this stuff was tied specifically to the company that sponsored Elasticsearch and Kibana, as well as um, you know, uh, to specific systems, and, and it was not easy for anybody to go out and build it. So, um, Open Search is its goal is to kind of continue forward uh, the um, continue forward in an open search an open source way um, with these tools. Um, so they're forked now, they're available on GitHub, and they're licensed purely Apache 2.0, and you can fork them, build them, do anything you want to with them. Um, that's allowable under the license, and it's um, you know Apache 2.0, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so we took that and then combined it with those uh, tools and um, plugins that were available for Open Distro, and that's kind of the whole project. Now, what is uh, Open Search intended for? It is intended for uh, log, metric, and trace analytics, so an analytical suite, as we were talking about before, um, but as well as for general or enterprise search. So that would be uh, collecting machine-generated data, um, so you can kind of understand your infrastructure, understanding your systems that you're working with, as well as this kind of data that might be collected in the course of doing business or in the course of running um, whatever services you need. So uh, general search might be catalog search or something along those lines. Um, it is, like I mentioned earlier, um, Apache 2.0 license, and that allows you to use, modify, extend, embed, monetize, resell, and make part of your own uh, product or service. Um, well understood parameters around the Apache license. Now, um, this is something that's really important uh, to us uh, as, as people who work at Amazon, um, and important to a number of other people as well. Um, a lot of organizations have a very specific allowable list of licenses that they can use um, for various reasons, maybe IP reasons or other um, kind of organizational reasons. Um, so uh, Apache is a, a kind of well used, well understood. It, it's very um, common license that most people are okay with. Um, that's really important. So we want this product to be used as widely as possible. So the Apache 2 license supports that. Now, everything here is um, in the project, with the exception of the website, which we'll get to in a second, is uh, Apache 2 licensed. So ALB2, we, we often turn into that. So that means all the plugins, all the tools, um, you know, uh, the open search and open search dashboards are licensed the same way. Um, 
And there's not, and, and you know, from the perspective of AWS, um, there's nothing that we're selling um, for OpenSearch itself. Uh, there'll be a service that will be running it for sure, and that's something that uh, AWS will sell, of course, um, like any other lines of business. But there's not anything that's going to be, you know, uh, this is this is fine until you reach a certain level, and then it's going to cost you money. This is all free to use um, under the Apache license. So um, I think that's important for us, to, for everybody to understand this is not um, something where there's an additional play here. Now, the status of the project. Um, we announced that we're going to do this in January. We introduced the alpha in April, beta one in May, and then um, we have a release candidate. And then finally, we'll get to general availability sometime in the middle of the year, summer in the uh, northern hemisphere and winter in the southern hemisphere, since we are talking about geospatial things today. Let's go a little bit deeper on OpenSearch. Um, OpenSearch is a distributed search engine, meaning that it can go beyond one instance and data can be spread out among multiple instances of that or nodes. Um, you interact with it via a REST API. So you have your, um, your HTTP verbs, which and, and then the pathway uh, or the URI that, that will dictate what happens to it. And then you have a payload made with JSON. And that's the primary way that you interact with OpenSearch. It performs uh, indexing and storage of data. It, with an emphasis on indexing, storage of data, of course, is supported. Um, but it's, it's distinct from a database in some very specific ways um, and from a typical database. So do keep that in mind um, when thinking about this. It's probably a mistake to think of it as a primary data store. Um, it is built in uh, Java using the Lucene library. Now, uh, Lucene is a, a search library. It provides a lot of the kind of search power of OpenSearch. Uh, it's been around for decades, uh, multiple decades now. Um, it's uh, widely used and, and it really does um, provide the source. And so a lot of a lot of the things that we'll talk about today are actually derived from the Lucene library. Um, so we'll mention that as well when I get to it. And then you have OpenSearch dashboards. Um, this is the browser-based UI visualization for OpenSearch. Now, when people say that, oh, I, I, I did this in um, you know, OpenSearch, they'll probably mean they did it with dashboards if they're interacting with it or kind of using it, saying that they looked up something. Um, that's a typical usage pattern. There's built-in charts and table representations, uh, so you don't have to create those things uh, from scratch. Um, and then you can kind of compose those things into dashboards. Um, and that's one of the kind of key things that people use this for is to take a bunch of data and represent it visually um, and, 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 and just to have an at a glance look that people are, are trying to understand a, a complex system. Um, you can interact with it using kind of the same type of open search um, um, DSL that you would use before, or use DQL, which is uh, dashboards query language, which simplifies um, a lot of this and enables you to get meeting out of things without having to write more complex queries. Um, we do have plugins as well uh, that allow you to use things like uh, SQL and things like uh, what we have a uh, one called PPL, which is a pipe programming language, uh, a processing language, excuse me, um, that enables you to, um, you know, an, an alternate way of querying the data. You can do that from dashboards as well. It's built in uh, TypeScript, um, so it runs on Node.js. So it, it's quite distinct from uh, OpenSearch in that it's an entirely different platform built by a, a different uh, team, uh, but they work together seamlessly. Um, relevant for this particular piece, it has uh, built-in maps. So um, you can visualize geospatial data uh, immediately in the software. Okay. Let's do a little personal story. I, I don't typically go this personal in one of my presentations, uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about where I am, where I live, and why I'm doing what I'm doing in a way, and how, um, oh, well, how this type of software uh, really helped me solve my problems and how maybe it could help you solve similar problems. Um, so I, I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, it's the northernmost city in Canada. Now, when I say city, it's uh, over a million inhabitants. There's certainly, um, you know, uh, settlements that are um, smaller than that, further north than us. It's certainly with, um, you know, more extreme climates, 
but it is a pretty extreme climate. Um, here's a little bit of trivia. Negative 40 is where Celsius and Fahrenheit converge. Uh, either way, it's just ridiculously cold. Now, that's not a, an average low. It's not a high or anything like that, but it does get that cold here on a regular basis. Um, additionally, it's possible for us to get snow 10 months out of the year. That's a big chunk of the year. Um, now, the majority of that time when you're talking about, especially as you get on either side of summer proper, uh, it's, it's flurries, um, but it is possible to snow. So that gives you a little idea of how cool it can get. It's also an energy capital. And when I say energy, I really mean oil. Uh, this part of Canada is um, has a lot of natural resources and a lot of fossil fuels, um, which certainly has positives, but it also has a lot of negatives, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. Now, those are things that are kind of, hmm, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe things people would, would think less of about, about this particular area. Let's um, talk a little bit about some positives. In summer, we have like 17 hours of sunlight uh, when you get towards the solstice, which is great. It's bright and sunny, uh, but it never really gets too hot. It's, uh, you know, it'll be sunny outside and then a pleasant uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in the summer. It is very nice. Um, you know, if you've ever been to the Bay Area, uh, it can be uh, the same temperature, but just kind of overcast, and it feels so much colder uh, than the same temperature being very sunny. Uh, in that same time in the summer, it never really uh, gets dark either. Uh, we don't have true night during that time, so it's sun all the time around. Uh, we do have twilight, where it gets kind of... Uh, you know, darker, but it never gets pitch black. Never true, technically, uh, darkness at that point. One thing that surprises a lot of people is that we have 321 sunny days a year, making it one of the sunniest places in North America, which is crazy uh, because most people don't think of a cold place being sunny, but it's certainly possible here. And because of our northern um, uh, um, location, we have a low solar angle as well, which will come into play a little bit later. Now, that's where I live, but what do I do for a living? I do this sort of thing. Um, I'm a developer advocate, and developer advocates um, tend to work with tech companies and talk a lot about um, projects and work with the communities that are involved in that. Now, Edmonton is not a tech hub. We do have a tech scene, but it's certainly not a place where, you know, companies, large companies have uh, that many offices. Um, and so I've kind of resigned myself to living here. Um, for various reasons. Um, we've decided this is where we wanted to live, but I'm not a tech hub and I work in tech. Um, and uh, all developer advocates travel a lot, or they did. Um, in 2019, I was a developer advocate as well, and I traveled, did 400, excuse me, 43 flights in that year. So um, that's a lot. Um, in 2020, we did eight, which is still quite a bit, considering that was only a couple months of uh, really only travel in January and February. Um, one of which was a major international trip to, to India, of all places. Um, so in 2021, I haven't traveled anywhere. And in fact, since the pandemic has started, I really haven't been more than probably 30 kilometers from my home, uh, which was vastly different than the 2019. But I've gone no place right now, but the world is starting to change and starting to um, go back. And I hope it continues to do so for everyone's sake. Um, and I expect that zero to change into a number not unlike 2020. And then in 2022, I think the number of flights that I will take will probably get close to what it was in 2019 um, as the pandemic goes behind us. Now, you may watch this video in the future and think you're wrong. Um, but the key thing here is that I have a pretty big carbon footprint just by nature of my uh, air, aircraft travel. Um, it's not a particularly clean way to go. So I actually care about that. And um, I know that this is the situation I'm in. Um, I will probably travel for the rest of my career. And um, what can I do to change that? Now, you can only control the things that you can control. So um, one of the things that I want to look at is, is as my wife and I decided that you know, this is where we were staying for the rest of our lives, um, one of the things that we can control is our home. And um, a typical home in this area, um, the house I'm in right now, in fact, is built in the 1960s. 
Um, it is insulated, but it's not insulated as well as a modern home, um, and it faces the wrong direction, and I'll tell you why. Um, so the, the house that we decided to build uh, would take advantage of uh, the climate and the uh, northern um, position of the city to um, actually reduce our, so our, our carbon footprint uh, as time goes on. Now, um, this house is built with a passive first, active second solar mentality. So the structure and positioning of the house is designed to actually be able to um, uh, take advantage of the sun. Um, so this is something we're currently doing right now, so I wish I could show you. Um, hopefully I do this presentation later and I can show what this means, but um, the goal here is to maximize the solar gain in the winter, thereby heating the home up, and minimizing the solar gain in the summer, thereby keeping uh, excess heat out. Um, this is achieved through a few different things. One, the structure of the house has overhangs, which prevent summer sunlight from getting into the house. And then um, it has windows on specific faces that take advantage of the low um, angle sun that comes in in winter um, and can then heat that home up using those solar, that, solar, um, um, that solar energy. Uh, the active part of it comes later, that would be solar panels and things like that, which is what typically people talk about. And that's where I can get the 321 um, sunny days a year uh, into this. So if I play my cards right, um, you know, I have almost no reliance on the grid and almost no reliance on um, fossil fuels. That's the goal, at least. So minimal energy input once built. Now, of course, there are, um, you know, carbon, um, building a home doesn't do that, but I think that, um, you know, with the appropriate controls on this, um, we'll be in a much better space than building, living in, say, a home like this that's built in the 1960s. It's not very energy efficient and uses traditional, um, you know, uh, natural gas uh, to heat the home. Um, so all of this stuff meant that I had to find this very specific site for my home. Um, for multiple reasons, we wanted to live in the city, but one of the bonuses was that living in a city would afford us what's called an urban heat island effect. You've probably experienced this before. This is a situation where you're in a city and just the nature of being a city warms it up. So all the cars that are around, all the homes that are being heated, <clears throat> the solar and the thermal mass of, the, um, of all the homes kind of resist the change of heat. Um, it all comes together to mean that the middle of the city is usually much warmer than the outlying areas. So that meant that I couldn't build this house out in the middle of a, a field, for example. It really, to take it the best advantage of this, would be in the city. There's other reasons for that as well. We'll get to it in a little bit. I wanted to have uh, something with a north-south orientation. So the widest front of it would be north and south. Um, and Really, I wanted to put all the windows on the south side. And that is because uh, you can control for the heat as the sun um, uh, you know, transits the sky in the, the day. Um, if you have a south facing one, you can certainly, uh, the angle sun can be um, shaded, but in the east and west, it's more difficult to do so. And consequently, I also want a clear sun path. I didn't want large buildings or large trees in the way of, of all the sun. So if you go to a real estate agent and ask for this, um, you're probably not going to be, it's not probably going to be very productive. Um, so I knew that I needed to take matters into my own hands. And I started this process of, start, of doing this when I started working with Open Distro. Um, and uh, as a consequence, I, I said, you know, let's, let, I'm going to learn all this stuff. Um, it was one of my ma first major projects on the, this was actually my own personal interest project. Um, Edmonton actually has a very extensive municipal open data initiative where anything that the city does is um, collected and then posted online for others to consume. Um, so that makes this really interesting from a person who's a data geek like myself. So I took 262,000 parcels. These are GeoJSON representations of all of the lots in the city, the legal lots in the city, and then a similar number of all the tax assessments. Um, these are, you know, how much taxes are paid for individual lots. Guess what? The unfortunate thing is that these things don't really line up and didn't have common IDs. So it, the tax assessments did have um, a uh, point to them, a geospatial point, and the parcels had geojson. So I was able to connect those things 
uh, only through um, common geospatial coordinates. The other thing that I was able to integrate was uh, all the city maintained trees. Uh, cities often have very careful records of the trees that they maintain. And Edmonton has this all through an urban forestry program, and they actually publish a list of all of the trees in the city and their locations. And I could use this to make sure that I was going to find a lot that wasn't too shaded. Other things that I looked at were public transportation maps. I was able to ingest that data in as a shape as well and find out how close or far uh, anything we were looking for would be to public transportation. This would also lessen our carbon footprint. And then the final thing I brought in was 141,000 building permits. Uh, the city makes all that data available. So what I was able to do with all this data was to look at this and try to narrow down the parcels that would make sense uh, possibly for being um, a, a site for my property. I was able to take those parcel information and find out you know, what direction it was, um, which is actually more challenging than anything else in this project. Um, and then be able to um, you know, take a look at the tax assessments and determine if it was going to be in my price range. Um, I'm not going to tear down a multi-million dollar home, for example. Um, look at building perm the trees, rather. Uh, and the trees would, would tell me if I was going to be shaded. Public transport maps would tell me if it was something that both my wife and I would enjoy living at and being able to take advantage of public transportation. And then um, looking at the uh, building permits would tell us you know, if something was actively being upgraded. So I was able to take all this data and the various forms it was in and bring it into Open Distro. Um, and start using that information to narrow down the uh, possible lots. And it, you know, when you go from 262,000, you keep on narrowing down and narrowing down until you're into a very small number. So um, I have, I'm happy to say we bought the perfect lot, um, a house that was uh, had foundation problems and would be uh, impossible to fix. Uh, came available. It met all my criteria and able was able to tell it uh, to tell us that by evaluating all the properties that came through the uh, real estate system and finding if they met my criteria. So a success, a totally weird usage of um, something like open search, um, but it works. So uh, and also can, these ideas can be generalized out. So it's not just that, but I didn't want to share this story with you because like I, it was a success. My wife and I are very excited in this picture um, when we closed on the on the property and we're in the process of building the, the new house um, as we speak. So with the personal story out of the way, let's talk about how geospatial indexing works in open search. Now, the thing to understand about um, this is that it's not flat. The world is not flat. If you think the world's flat, none of this math is gonna work out. Uh, it's not going to be a very useful time for you. <laughs> this is not some sort of desk. We're on a globe. Um, in fact, I, globe's not even accurate. Uh, it's a oblate spheroid, right? So it's kind of like a flattened pumpkin. And um, but we do use a grid system, uh, latitude and longitude, which everybody knows about. Um, but I'm not sure everybody has really thought about everything in it. Um, if you take a think about the distance between the longitude lines and um, on the on the globe, the, it, it varies as you go north and south. Um, so. Uh, Edmonton, Canada, for example, we're in the north, so the distance between those um, is small. Um, and then when you go to someplace Quito in Ecuador, which is on the equator, um, it's much larger. You can kind of see it on this representation here. Um, and the, the distance between points on this globe is called the Great Circle Distance. And in fact, the Great Circle Distance is um, not even a true representation. It doesn't take into account that um, specific shape. I think it generalizes more towards a sphere. Um, so we, it actually is a kind of an interesting thing. Now, there, as you can imagine, there's quite a bit of math involved. Um, and this is the Haversin formula. This is scary. Um, this is the simple one. There's more complicated ones to tell the distance between two points. Um, as you might think about this from a perspective of uh, a, a search engine, this is not going to work. Um, there's an enormous amount of floating point math that has to occur, and you have to do it on every document, right? So if you want to find if something was in a shape, you'd have to, you know, define those shapes and then do a lot of calculations. It's just, it's O of N and it's just not feasible. So let's back up and talk a little bit about how open search actually works in general. Um, 
Well, most of the think of indexing, we'll probably think of something called a forward index. And a forward index takes your documents or some sort of ID and then gives properties to those documents. And um, the key thing is that all the properties are kind of um, on the right side of the document, if you think about it that way. Um, and so you look up McDonald's has these properties. And when I'm saying the property here, uh, I'm referring to its logo. So, and what it is, it's a restaurant with a red and yellow logo and uh, Subway is a restaurant with a green and yellow logo. These are just some brands that have that are iconic, a lot of people will know. Um, so you can kind of think about this. Now, an inverted index is a little bit different. In this way, an inverted index takes the property and then matches it to the document ID, um, which is really convenient because most time you're asking for properties and trying to get documents back out. So in this case, um, if you were to say, find um, you know, all of the restaurants that have red in their logo, you can take the restaurant uh, property and find all those documents and then do a set operation with the red, um, all the, the red property and all of those documents and where they kind of come out, that's where you're going to be able to say these are the documents, the ones that meet both conditions. So that being said, how do you apply that to geospatial indices? Well, um, this is based on something called a BKD or a binary K uh, depth tree. So a multi-dimensional um, tree effectively. Now, I my colleague, Nick, uh, who actually wrote a lot of this in Lucene is so much better at explaining this to me. And it's fascinating to hear him. He couldn't be here today uh, to help me with this presentation, but I hope next time we talk about this, um, you can hear him talk about it. Or if you ever hear of Nick from the open search team talking about geospatial stuff, you have to go through it. I'm going to do my best to explain it. Um, so uh, in this, basically those um, there's pre-computed geospatial uh, georepresentational indices that are reflected inside the BKD tree, and this allows you to quickly look up um, things and then have a small index size. Um, this is relatively straightforward uh, when you get to the uh, points. Now, points are a coordinate, um, latitude and longitude. And then they're quantized into a single integer. So uh, it's it's really an estimation, and it, each one goes to like the seventh decimal when we're quantizing those, um, which is good enough. Um, so, uh, by the way, I, I say I'm going to say good enough quite a bit in this. Um, don't try to build like a self-driving car with OpenSearch, uh, not yet at least. Uh, you're going to wind up running into buildings. It is good enough for most circumstances, um, <clears throat> but uh, you don't use it to um, figure out where you are in a very small uh, amount of space. It's not going to be that accurate. Um, and then each integer works as a node in the tree, and you're able to uh, walk the tree and uh, find the indices that are represented there. And uh, it has a lot of properties that are really useful for being able to do this. So that's relatively straightforward. Now, where it gets a little different is with shapes. So you can define not only a point in OpenSearch, but you can also define shape. And shapes are um, a little bit trickier. If you start thinking about a shape, you can think about the shape as a query. Like, OK, am I querying something inside of a shape, for example? Um, am I querying the shape of a piece of irregularly drawn um, boundaries? Um, how do you represent that? That, that? that can get complicated. But actually, the, the the way it works is kind of um, something you're probably pretty familiar with. It actually works a lot like video games work. If you paid attention to video games before and how they represent 3D space, they've actually composed those three that 3D space into a series of polygons. And they just break down into triangles, right? Well, it's the simplest polygon. And um, the collision detection, all this stuff is things that are well understood. And um, from an, a search perspective, you're using some of the very similar things. So if you have a shape, any shape can be composed into triangles effectively, you can be tessellated. Um, and on top of that, um, we have to do a couple of little tricks um, to make it make sense for this. Now, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this. This is something that took me a little while to understand. It's still using BKD representation, but instead of using you know, uh, two representations, it's using uh, seven dimensions, um, which 
breaks people's brains, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, the seven dimensions represent both the bounding box and the triangle uh, that makes up a shape. So you may have a single shape that has many of these seven dimensional uh, values. So in the triangle, or in this shape, let's look at these numbers uh, associated on the screen here. Uh, one is uh, through uh, four are the bounding box, and then five through seven are the triangle within it. Now, by itself, you might think, why are you including the bounding box? What that enables you to do is quickly start to generate uh, uh, other sets that are surrounding it. So if you start thinking about this, you look at the, the space between seven and six on here um, in the direction of two, um, there'll be another triangle that will meet seven and six, and its bounding box will overlap with the bounding box represented by one through four. And the same will be true as you represent on the side seven and five in the direction of one, or six and five in the direction of four. You're gonna have all these overlapping boxes, um, because then you'll be able to see what's all around it, and that's gonna start forming your inverted index. It's actually fascinating, um, and I'm doing the, the very briefest explanation of this. You don't really have to understand any of this to use it, but I, I think from a perspective of being a knowledgeable person on how these uh, functions work, or these features work, um, it's important to understand this. Now, of course, um, there are, are drawbacks to some of these things. One thing I wanna to touch a little bit on is um, something that you may have picked up on is that this is all Cartesian, this is X and Y. And this does not take into account uh, the shape of the Earth entirely. Now, there are some averaging that's going on that, that gives us an estimation, uh, but it's not compensating for this. Is it still Cartesian and making some assumptions based on that? Now, the true representation of the points and shapes on a white spheroid is a slightly more complicated problem, but the same um, basic ideas can be used to do that, and then it can, can be corrected with the, this, this idea of Geo 3D. Um, but if you start thinking about, especially you start thinking about a triangle that's, or a, a sphere that's been tessellated um, into a number of triangles, and then you start thinking about the angles that come out from that, if you were to project this, um, you can start to understand how you can correct for points and how they might be slightly different. And this is something that, that's being worked on actively right now. And it's something that, uh, you know, this is kind of like where uh, our, our geospatial um, desires are to be is to actually get this where we have the ability for, um, you know, uh, you know, true representation of of any oblate spheroid uh, to be in the code. So obviously this has trade-offs, right? Um, so you're gonna be doing a heck of a lot of more math to do this um, because you are working in a, a more three-dimensional, more space, it's a three-dimensional space, um, more than uh, any type of corrected uh, two-dimensional space. But um, what is really fascinating about this is you could do this for multiple different things. So for example, if you have the geometry uh, for Earth, that works fine. Most people are going to be on Earth, but what if we wanted to, you know, talk about something that wasn't um, our planet? We could still do that uh, by just changing some of the parameters in it. So you really kind of start getting into these things that are just super exotic and super interesting, um, you know, talking about the potential of these systems going to different planets and still making sense. Um, so it, it really gets into the things that you may not have uh, assumed that something like open search could do, but um, we hope that as we go beyond Cartesian, uh, the system is set up to really carry forward into really exotic use cases. So let's stop for a second, bring it back down to earth literally, and um, talk about some examples of how this looks. Now, um, I'm gonna give you the, the fastest overview of a practical example as I can. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, you can find your own research and, and hopefully get started with it. The first thing to talk about is where you might use different things. A geo point is great for features without a really defined or important shape. So, or maybe something that's really small. Um, I kind of think of this, a good example, this is a city center. Like you can look up the coordinates of city centers around the world. And um, 
But those city centers, um, you don't really care about the boundaries of it. You might care how far you are from it. Let's say that you are um, trying to route something around and saying, you know, should I route it to city A or city B? You probably don't care about outskirts or what municipal boundaries are, but you do care about how far you are from a given location. Uh, IP geolocations also, you don't super care. There's not really a defined shape with those. Um, useful when you're trying to look at flow data or something like that. It's not really important about um, a shape there. Um, you're just saying, okay, this is going from point A to point B and point A and point B are in number of kilometers apart. And then uh, in my example, like I don't have any shape data for the tree that I might be looking at when I was trying to determine if it would shade my lawn. That's not something that's recorded just because it wouldn't be a very useful representation in this type of coordinate system. I'm sure that you could, um, but it probably would be eaten up by any, um, you know, um, estimations that occur inside of it. So the first thing to know when you're creating this is that your index needs to support that field. In this case, our location field is what we're using. So you can see that highlighted on the screen. Um, and then we have a type of a geo point, and that's the kind of um, the type that you were using to define geo points that don't have uh, any more than just a single set of coordinates. So that's what you're doing to prepare your index for it. And then when you add the document, you're actually using um, a, a coordinate system as well. And that coordinate system is in lawn lat, so longitude latitude rather than lat lawn, which is the typical way we talk about it um, as humans. Uh, but a lot of coordinate systems are inverted from that. Um, so pretty straightforward. Of course, you can see here that they are both put as the verb, um, but we're, the, the path is slightly different on the API. Uh, so the bottom one is for adding the document, and the uh, top one is for adding the index. Moving along to shapes, um, this is an example of things that you might use for um, things that actually have um, structure and shape. So that might be uh, a land area or some sort of boundary, like a municipal boundary in a neighborhood or um, a province, a country, that sort of thing, even structures. Um, so you might be able to have the um, geojson shape of a building, for example. Um, similar, almost exactly the same thing. Um, we have a different field name here, but you can make your field names whatever you want them to be. Um, but your type is geoshape. Now, um, when you're looking at uh, putting the document in here, it's very similar as well, uh, but you're using uh, arrays of coordinates, right? Um, so in this case, we have multiple nested layers here, but these are the shapes that are inside of this shape, um, and then there will be a series of coordinates. And again, it's in the longitude and latitude format. So uh, this would be a much longer list, um, and these can get quite big. Now, for both um, geoshapes and points, there are other representations that will work in OpenSearch. And um, with that, uh, make sure that you understand what your different representations are um, and how your data is coming in. I think these are the easiest to understand, but a lot of stuff will not uh, be in this format. It will be in a variety of other formats. Um, so I did find when I was bringing all that data in, there was some inconsistencies in that. So I did have to do a little bit of manipulation of the text that came in from like a CSV file that might have a point in it um, and getting it into a format that would be amenable to, to this type of structure. So um, finding the data with bounding boxes is one of the simplest ways to look at this. Um, and um, this kind of goes off of um, this idea of a, of a query and a query would have filtering um, and then we're filtering by a specific field. And in this case, we're doing something quite simple here. Uh, top left and bottom right, um, and then we're just supplying the coordinates that you that would be needed for this. And there's uh, certainly more things that you can do with it um, that would do this. This is just the simplest example that I can fit on a slide. Um, but the, the features are quite powerful. So that's some examples of how to use this. Um, again, you know, these all boil down to uh, something as simple as uh, JSON um, being sent to an HTTP endpoint. You know, that's something that you can do in almost any language and set tools up to use it. It's a very common way of doing this. So um, take a look at what you can do with it and, and make sure that um, you're bringing your data in, but you can be rewarded by being able to store that and find the data qu more quickly than you certainly could uh, a lot of other ways. So I would be remiss to not really give you some uh, talk about contribution and involvement. Now, 
open search is an open source um, project and uh, we are certainly open to contribution and involvement from the community um, we have a team at amazon working on this and we do most of our um, communication uh, and we're trying to do all really but mo right now most is probably an accurate way of saying um, our communication in the open um, and one of the key places we do that is on github um, our github organization is the open search project or open search project open search dash project as you see on the screen um, and that has a number of repos in them there are two pinned repos in this there's open search and open search dashboards and then there's a lot of other repos in here, and those are like anomaly detection is one plugin. And then we split those into um, the open search side and the open search dashboard side, which would be uh, the open search would be in a JVM type language side, and then the dashboard side would be in a TypeScript. Um, and that would be the front end of this. Um, there's also in this some um, repos that are, are non code related, how to do plugins and migrate and a few things like that. We try to keep all technical document, uh, technical um, tools and um, you know documents in uh, GitHub, and then um, we have uh, the rest of the project communication occurs in else in other forums. Um, we have a discourse um, that uh, is the best way to communicate with people on the team and those who are using Open Search, uh, and a lot of planning occurs on the forums. It's a really open community. I will certainly be there to, to welcome you. Um, I am Searchy McSearchface on the forum, so I have a very uh, appropriate name um, over there, and I'm a moderator on the forums, which uh, it's a good group of people. Then uh, we have a blog on our opensearch.org site, um, and uh, we're hoping to post quite a bit of information there, news and technical articles about the project. And we also have a list of events that we'll be doing. Now, right now we're in a weird time with events. Um, events are not in person. Um, like I said, we'll probably be moving on, uh, to in-person events as soon as we safely can. But for now, we do have a bi-weekly community meeting. Um, it's hosted by myself um, and uh, it's on, on Meetup, but we do it through Zoom. And uh, I, I think it's actually, it's, it's a really special, um, it's a really special community for me uh, because it is, a group of people that are willing to help each other out. Um, we went back and forth, and at some point we tried a webinar format uh, to account for things like Zoom bombing and some other stuff like that, but it just wasn't the same. And the real key here is uh, not only are, are there going to be presentations about things, but there's, a, there's time to ask questions, and there's time to interact with other people in the community. So this is really important to making sure that, that uh, you have a voice. Uh, you're feel free to, to uh, you know, ask questions in our community meetings. Um, it's a, a really open environment and, and we, we do our best to make sure that uh, you feel welcome. So those are every other week and uh, the, the schedule will be on opensearch.org. Okay, well, that's what I have today. I, I truly wanna thank you for spending some time with me hearing about my silly project hearing about our awesome open source project. Um, and, um, you know, I hope that we stay in touch. I really want to thank you for the, this time. Um, you can find me at all of these places. Um, like I said, uh, these are all there on the forum. You can find me at Searchy McSearchface. Uh, and so uh, please do check out Open Search at opensearch.org. And uh, we hope you have a great day and hope you find a place for uh, geospatial in your workflow. <laughs>